For our call to worship today, we look to the Psalms, and the Psalm for today is from Psalm 145. And this is a response to reading, so I invite you to um, read the words that are in white, and I will read the ones that are in yellow to start. So let's read the Psalm together. I will extol you, my God and King. Every day I will bless you. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. One generation shall extol your works to another. They will recount the glorious splendor of your majesty. The Lord is just in all his ways. The Lord is near to all who call on him. He fulfills the desire of all who fear him. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. So we come together today to worship and sing praise to God. And I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing our first hymn, We Praise, We Worship You, O God. Spirit, 
that the lives we touch are blessed also. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's bring to God our prayers of confession. Lord, we are amazed and sometimes overwhelmed that you call on us to work with you for your kingdom and your purposes in our world. Forgive us when we try to do your work in our own strength and don't consult with you. Forgive us when we become so focused on what we want to achieve, we think our way is the best way. Forgive us when we forget that you promise to be with us and empower us for all that you call us to do. Help us to rest and rely on you. Strengthen us to be people of faith, people refreshed and empowered by your spirit. Remind us that despite our weaknesses and our failures, you are shaping and reshaping our lives in new and exciting ways. And so we pray that the greatness of your love will be truly visible as we seek to glorify you in all we do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear these words of forgiveness. The psalm reminds us that all who cry out to God will be saved. And the scripture affirms that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And so I can declare to you with confidence, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our scripture readings today um, come from the Old Testament book of Haggai, um, the prophet, and from 2 Thessalonians, and Christine's going to read those for us. Thank you, Chris. The Old Testament reading is from Haggai chapter 1, verse 15, to chapter 2, verse 9. On the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of King Darius. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Is it not in your sight as nothing? Yet now take courage, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Take courage, O Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Take courage, all you people of the land, says the Lord. Work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts according to the promise that I made you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit abides among you, do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once again in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations so that the treasure of all the nations will come, and I will fill this house with splendour, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The latter splendour of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. The New Testament reading is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. We must thank God at all times for you, friends you whom the Lord loves. For God chose you as the first to be saved by the Spirit's power to make you his holy people and by your faith in the truth. God called you to this through the good news we preach to you. He called you to possess your share of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, our friends, stand firm and hold on to those truths which he taught you both in our preaching and in our letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and in his grace gave us unfailing courage and a firm hope, encourage you and strengthen you to always do and say what is good.
for the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Now, we've got some children here. I want to talk to you today about someone I don't know if you've heard of. Who's heard of Ned Brockman? Oh, didn't anybody watch? Oh, a couple of people watched the news. That's good. Well, I'll tell you about You saw Ned Brockman? Now, this is an amazing story because Ned Brockman is just like an ordinary bloke. And he decided that he wanted to raise some money for a homeless charity um, that he was very keen on. And so he ran from coast to coast across Australia. He ran 4,000 kilometres in 47 days. Uh, and, <laughs> and he raised $2.5 million. Wow, good one, Ned Rockman. Yes. And even the Prime Minister said congratulations to him. So there are a lot of people saying, well done, Ned Rockman. And um, of course, this took a lot of planning. You can imagine if he's going to run that far. I guess he did some training, because I know if I had to do it, you know, we'd, who'd be doing training if you had to do it? Well, I wouldn't even be doing it, let alone doing the training. But he, he obviously must have done some training, but he also gathered a whole heap of sponsors so that he could get the money. He also gathered a backup team. Um, they weren't allowed, apparently legally, to run on the road with him. So that's why he looks so lonely there. They could follow him in their cars or their vans or whatever, and they would feed him every now and again. But they couldn't be right beside him. But he had a big team of people who supported him and, and fed him and watered him and let him have a rest. But he ran apparently about 12 to 14 hours a day. Can you imagine that? And you could imagine that if he's doing that, Oh, there's one of his supporters. He had some pretty rough times in those 47 days. We could believe that, couldn't we? There were times where things didn't go as he had hoped or as he planned. Apparently, he had some broken bones as well. I'm not exactly sure what got broken. It might have been his ribs or something. But he, he had some broken bones. He had a whole lot of problems. And there he is with one of his supporters. He had a lot of supporters, a lot of people helping him, you know, do this. But in the end, he ran from Cottesloe Beach, which is near Perth, in Perth, on Western Australia. Do you know where Western Australia is? Do you know where that is? Because you're not really from Australia, are you? Okay, that's all right, you'll work it out. And, and Mum will show you when, when you go home, get a map and work out where Western Australia is and see if you can find Perth. That's the capital of Western Australia. And that's sort of right over on one side of Australia. And he ran right across the continent, through the Nullarbor, right across, and there he is in Bondi Beach in Sydney. So that's on the other coastline. And that's him going across the finish line. Look at all the people cheering him on and supporting him. So all those people were supporting him in one way or another, but he also had people following him. So he had a lot of help, but he achieved his goal. And he raised $2.5 million for Mobilise, which is a homeless charity. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah, I think that's really amazing. Um, I'm not about to set out doing that, but I'm very um, in awe of the work that he did. When I was um, reading the scripture for today, it reminded me of this story I'd seen about Ned, because the people had come back to Israel and they had an enormous task ahead of them and they were really really sad and depressed about what was going to happen because they couldn't rebuild the temple and Haggai the prophet he was one of the encouragers and he said take courage be strong for I am with you says the Lord and this is some words that we can remember no matter what we've got to face that God is with us Take courage, be strong. Now they thought they had an impossible task, probably impossible like running across Australia or even worse. But God said he would be with them. God asks us to do some things sometimes. And when we read that scripture reading from Thessalonians today, it said we should be kind and good. And God will help us be strong and have courage to do just what God calls us to do and to live how God wants us to live. And that's the 
text from Thessalonians. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us, remember God loves us, and gave us unfailing courage, unfailing courage and a firm hope, encourage you and strengthen you to always do and say what is good. That's what God calls us to do. Sometimes he calls us, calls different ones of us to do different jobs for him, different things. Like God called me to come here and, and be with you for this 15 months. <laughs> and I've had a good time. I've enjoyed it. So God calls us to do different things. You can hope that God doesn't call you to come and preach every Sunday. But, you know, that's fine if he does. He'll, if he does call you to do that, he'll give you the strength and the courage to do it. You see, anything God calls us to do, he strengthens us and gives us the courage to do it. So that's what you have to remember. And if nothing else, it strengthens you to always do and say what is good. Remember God is with us. Just like Ned had to have a big team of people supporting him and following him and encouraging him so he could do that goal of getting across Australia, running across Australia, God is with us and strengthens us and encourages us for whatever he calls us to do. Do you think you can remember that? Good girl. Now, there's a song I want to share with you today. And the reason I, one of the reasons I like this song is because it's memorable. Okay? That means for those that are the naysayers, it's repetitive. Okay? <laughs> Don't be a naysayer. Um, so, but it means that we remember it. And sometimes we need to remember these words because they, we have difficult times in our lives, don't we? And we have to remember and remind ourselves that God is with us. And there's many times um, when I'm feeling a little bit, you know, oh, what's going to happen? Or a bit, you know, dubious about what's ahead. I've got to remember that God is with us. And this song runs around in my head. So I hope you might not be happy about me saying this, but I'm hoping this song runs around in your head. <laughs> for a long time. Okay, thanks, Naaman. Thank you. Let's listen to the music. didn't belong in that window. And looking back, 
it seems that maybe we were easily amused. <laughs> But it was a challenge to look with eyes that could see what was wrong in the window display. And apparently there's a bit of a skill with that. Because apparently when Houdini, the great magician, was a small boy, his father trained him to see things that other people failed to observe. And that was apparently one of his strengths, you see. So whenever they passed a store window, his father would ask him to notice things that were on display for just a few seconds, and after they walked on, Houdini was then asked to name the contents of the window. Like a bit of a game we used to play. And at first he could only remember a few items, but with some practice, he learned to notice the contents of a crowded display window as he walked by and give an accurate description of them afterwards. He noticed he learned to notice as well as to see. To see. We see what we're prepared to see is the other thing. Of course, some people only see the negative. One lady tells how after years of persuasion, her mother was finally talked into having a cataract operation. I know some of you have done that, right? And it's amazing because you can see a whole lot after that, apparently. So returning home from the hospital, the mother sat down in front of the picture window, which looked out onto the lake. And the daughter was very excited and said, do you notice any difference in the view, mum? And she said, I certainly do, the mother replied. Don't you ever dust? <laughs> so, I won't take her to my place. <laughs> We only see what we're prepared to see. The Jews had been conquered and scattered. Their temple built by King Solomon had been plundered and burned. The very beautiful temple had been decimated. And the people had been carted off to Babylon and exiled. And now little by little, some of the Jewish population from the exile had rejoined the survivors. A new governor had been appointed and a high priest had been invest invested for the temple. Farms were again producing food, markets were well stocked and comfortable homes were being built. And some businesses were even thriving. So after about 18 years, many Jews were again prosperous. It took a while, but they were prosperous and yet the temple still lay in ruins. It would have been quite difficult to be cheerful in the Jerusalem that they found when they returned. Ringing in their ears were the grand promises of the prophet Isaiah, which would have led many Jews to expect that their new Jerusalem would be a land of milk and honey. Instead, they found ruin and deprivation. It seems as though God had failed to fulfill his promises. Cries for help to God appeared to be unanswered. The people were plunged into a spiritual despondency that comes not just when God seems far away, but also when promises are fulfilled, but in ways that are far less, far, far less than what was expected or hoped for. And then God spoke through the prophet Haggai and he called the people to build my house. You've taken care of yourselves for long enough, now build my house. So the people began reconstruction, but it was not an easy task. Even with the support of the top political and religious leaders like Zerubbabel and Joshua, the work goes very slowly. Construction supplies are limited and resources are scarce. And some of the older folk can remember the former temple and the glory days that went with it. And then three times Haggai emphatically encourages the government and religious leaders and the people to be strong. He says it three times, be strong, take courage, calling them to continue to work with boldness and not to give in 
or give up. The God who called them into existence and who was with them in their exile is also with them now, he says. Sometimes, um, circumstances and times in our lives can be beyond explanation. Events can challenge and shake us, and shake us sometimes to the core of our existence. Christians who've journeyed some way along the road know that such times call for courage in the face of uncertainty. A courage not based on our own efforts or our resources or what we actually see in front of us, but courage to keep going because God who is faithful is with us. But for the people of Haggai's day, it was obvious that this new temple was not going to be a patch on the old one, and the people are despondent. But the prophet Haggai sees something different. He sees something different. Certainly, he's a realist, and he knows that this new effort, however much they put in, will not measure up to the standard of the previous temple and its beauty. And God's word comes through Haggai to affirm that God's glory will fill this new construction in a greater way than in the past, and with splendor not worth comparing to the way it was. That's the message that Haggai brings. God will fill the new temple. It'll be better than before. God is working in our congregation here in Caloundra. And it may not be the same shape as things have been in the past. But God is faithful. Take courage, Haggai says. Take courage, all you people. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. My spirit abides among you. I will fill this house with splendour, says the Lord of hosts. How is he going to do that? The historical record makes it clear that in materialistic terms, the promise for these people was never completely realised. That the new temple they built, they built was nowhere near as spectacular as the old one. Didn't look a bit like it. The critics and the naysayers would have been out in force. But you see, God did do a more amazing work of splendour filling the temple than before. God did fulfil his promise, but not in the way that they thought. How did he do that? He wrote his law on their hearts. He wrote his law, not on tablets held in the temple, but on the hearts of the people who occupied the space. The early Christians came to see the significance of this prophecy and understood that all that Israel's God had not done in history, in building the temple more glorious than before, in the building, will be done beyond history through Jesus and his holy body, the church. That's us. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? The scripture tells us. This new temple was one where the splendour was not on the outside, but on the inside. The splendour of God in the way in which they returned wholeheartedly to God. They made God first priority in their lives. They served him with all their being and God shone through them, and that was glorious. God calls us to allow him to build a church of splendour in this place. And this is a new thing that God is doing. And it's not like it was in the past. It's a new thing. It's a new reality. But it's God's reality. And sometimes we have difficulty seeing it. What is to come will be so much glorious than the life we know now or have known before. If we're ready for it and if we're prepared 
to allow God to show us what he wants and how he's going to do it. God makes promises to the people and he makes promises to us. Take courage. Three times he said, take courage, take courage. Be strong, be strong, be strong. He says, I am with you. My spirit abides among you. Do not fear. I will fill this place with splendor, better than before. In the face of all those promises of God that have not come true or that have come true only in fragmentary and partial ways, the prophet's word stands. Do not fear. The God who is the Lord of both history and beyond history is in the midst of the people of faith as he is today. And God's promises will be fulfilled in ways that go beyond our imaginings. We pray for that. I pray for that. I hope you're praying for that too. That God is the God of our future. And he goes before us. He supports us. He gives us the strength we need for all he calls us to do. Do not fear. I am with you forever and ever. Amen. We sing the hymn, Have Faith in God, My Heart. <coughs> I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing together. One of the joys we have as a congregation is to welcome um, new members who come to us. And um, today we're going to be welcoming Patsy and Ed for them. And I've got you to come down the front to me uh, with us now, please, Patsy and Ed, as um, we come to welcome them with their transfer of their membership. Members that every member of the church is engaged to confess the faith of Christ crucified and to be his faithful servant. And in every con each congregation, the members are to meet regularly to hear God's word, to celebrate the sacraments, to build one another up in love, to share in the wider responsibilities of the church, and to serve the world. That's from our regulations. I present to you Patsy and Ed Fulham, who are transferring from Armadale United Church to be received as confirmed members of this congregation. Patsy and Ed, do you reaffirm your allegiance to Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord? I do. Do you accept membership in this congregation promising to share in the life and worship of the church. So the congregation here gathered today really welcome Patsy and Ed into the fellowship of this congregation. And when you offer them your friendship and support, we will. We will. Good on you. So let's pray. Let's pray for, um, for them and for us. God our Father, we praise you for calling us to faith and for gathering us into the church, the body of Christ. We thank you for this congregation of your people and rejoice that you've added these dear friends to our congregation. Together may we live in the spirit, building one another up in love, sharing in the life of the church and serving the world for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you and a big welcome to you and as a sign of welcome, we give you the right hand of fellowship. Thank you for and amen our chairperson. Welcome to you too. We all welcome you. Let's give them a clap. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Yes, thank you. Isn't that fun? That's joyful, isn't it, when we can welcome people? We come to a time of prayer as we pray for ourselves and for others. And especially as we pray today, we're going to pray for Jim and Chris. They're off to Mondogra. They've got a lot of itinerant workers, I believe, who've started there now which is good because they need that help and they apparently need clothes we're glad about that too so it's good that you're able to go and share some of the resources that we have with with others and we're pleased about that so we're going to pray for you especially as we pray for other things that are on our hearts and minds so let's pray as we come to prayer today, um, we think of those we know and those we love. And Lord, we do lift Jim and Chris to you as they head off on their trip on Thursday to take these things from our congregation to our 
a sister congregation in Mandala. We pray for safe journeys for them. And we pray for the people there that you bless them as they interact with the workers in that place. We think of others that we know who are known to us and, and those we love and we think of their needs. Those who are unwell, those who might be grieving, the lonely, and those who might face difficult situations. And while we take a moment to not only name them before you, Lord, but as we pray for them, we visualize holding them and bringing them to you. As you wait with your arms outstretched to heal and to bless, we bring them to you. Today we especially pray for young people facing end of year exams and open futures. Sustain them and guide them, Lord. For all those studying and completing studies for the year, uphold them and give them the direction they need. And Lord, we pray for ourselves, your church, in this place. We are your church and we choose life overflowing and abundant in all its variations of light and shade. You call us to work for justice. Set our feet on the journey of justice making, ready to hit the road when action against injustice is required. You call us to compassion. Open our arms to embrace the suffering world and to stand with those in need. You call us to be bringers of hope and joy. Give us the courageous voices of prophets and visionaries with the imagination to dream of what might be and not to settle for what is. You call us to love the world audaciously boldly, overtly, and publicly, so much that it truly makes a difference. Come Holy Spirit, flow in and around us, through us and throughout us, overflow and flood into every nook and cranny of our lives. Come Holy Spirit, light a burning desire within us to be the church that you dream, the church at its best. Amen. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our final hymn is that a hymn for the church, filled with the Spirit's power. And I invite you to stand as you're able so that we can sing together. by the great mercy of God, embraced by the life and love of Jesus Christ, and held fast by the unfailing strength and presence of the Holy Spirit, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. Let's sing together um, and share with each other the peace of God as we sing peace to you. Thank you. 